Good morning. Um, let's, uh, let's pray, and then I'll dive into where we had left off last week. Uh, God, I do thank you for your word. I do pray that you'd help us. Uh, give us humility, give us love, uh, give us uh, winsomeness, uh, that if there is any um, offense uh, to our lives or the words that we would say, uh, may it be the offense that comes uh, from the truth and from the gospel. Uh, give us um, a gladness uh, in uh, bearing hope, uh, bearing witness to the hope uh, that we have. Uh, make us uh, ready, uh, even through this class, and help us as we uh, try to consider um, either the text of Scripture directly uh, or, or the implications of what you have said in, in how it is that we are to think uh, and speak and act. And I do pray that you'd use this uh, for our benefit, uh, for your glory, and for the building up of your church. And we do pray in Christ's name. Amen. Um, is there like a little bit of a ring to this, or am I a little bit loud? No, it sounds okay? All right, it's maybe just me. That's fine. <clears throat> okay. Uh, there is uh, a handout uh, in the back, if you've not gotten one. This is the same one that I had passed out last week for right now. Uh, so if you have last week's, then you won't need another one, but there are more back there. Uh, we're going to begin by uh, finishing uh, the outline of what I had given you as uh, what I'm describing as four features of a faithful defense of the faith. Um, and uh, this is, again, uh, either taken from or at least inspired by uh, much of what William Edgar goes through in his book, uh, Reasons of the Heart, Recovering Christian Persuasion. Though listening to last week's class and this one, don't think that that means there's not much that that book can offer. <laughs> uh, he's, uh, uh, there's many helpful things in there. So I'd encourage you to check it out if you do get a chance. But the fourfold framework is very much inspired uh, by him as a former professor of mine. Uh, we've gone through uh, the, the question of uh, recognizing and making use of common ground in a verbal and practical agreement uh, that we might have with others, and then, and then recognizing what is the, the same context of general revelation that exists in all of creation uh, in how, what it is that God reveals in the things that he's made, made how it is that it is perceived, um, and, and had some comment as to how we make use of that as, uh, as common ground. Uh, our second main heading was to look then at, the, at exposing uh, the reality of unbelief, uh, the, the kind of uh, one, one sort of uh, a way in which we can do this logically is uh, reductio ad absurdum. We take uh, someone's premises and bring it uh, all the way to its conclusion. You can expose the falsehood of what is false, uh, the unbelieving uh, worldview is uh, unlivable, untenable, incoherent, uh, and foolish. Uh, then we talked a little bit about how you can expose the functional dependence on what is true. You cannot help but live in God's world, on God's terms, even if the truth is suppressed. Um, and then finally, uh, wanting to get to the root of it all is exposing a basic commitment to worshiping the creature rather than the creator. Now, the purpose of this, that section of uh, exposing the reality of unbelief is to impress upon the person that we're speaking to um, uh, the, the reality of being uh, without excuse, as Paul describes it in Romans 1. Now, if that's all that we do, <laughs> all you've done uh, is simply uh, shown uh, that the, there is no foundation, that the only foundation is the, is the thing that is denied and there's no offering of hope um, or encouragement that comes with the gospel. So that's where this third section comes, up and comes in and is so necessary um, and, and is the point at which uh, we begin to get to uh, what perhaps may be uh, uh, central to Peter's focus in First Peter uh, is it 3.15, uh, 1 Peter 3.15, and giving a reason for the hope that is within us as we remember what our hope is, focusing on Christ who has entered into heaven, as the context there suggests, uh, where there is a need to speak the gospel. Not necessarily in this order, uh, but in some fashion, the gospel of Christ Jesus as made known in the scriptures. 
uh, first thing I want to consider here is that uh, sometimes we feel like uh, the, to move from uh, talking about general revelation, the things that are commonly seen, at least in principle, commonly seen and made known, uh, to, then, uh, uh, to then moving to talking about the content of what the scriptures say and are made known, we feel as though we're making this sort of huge leap, right? Uh, they accept uh, certain things about the world, so we're going to reason from those premises, but the scriptures, of course, unbelievers don't take this to be the word of God, right? We can't, we can't broach the subject of what the scriptures say until we've crossed that hurdle that they accept it as the word of God, is, is the feeling that we sometimes have. But here's the first thing I just encourage you with, um, that the movement from general revelation to special revelation is not as much of a jump uh, that we sometimes uh, feel that it is. Um, just as an example here, um, in Acts 17, won't you turn there briefly? Uh, this, is, this is probably a, a, a kind of a distillation of the things that Paul has said. His, his actual speech was probably longer than what is recorded here, uh, though it is an accurate summary um, and distillation or perhaps even portion of what he had said. Um, but Acts 17, um, I'm not going to read it all now, but you can just sort of scan and notice from verse 22 and following as Paul is speaking to the men of Athens, those who would not have accepted an understanding of what the scriptures are as we understand it, um, still speaks very clearly of the God who made the world, verse 24, and everything in it, uh, him not living in temples made by hand, and even talking about how in verse 26, he made from one man every nation um, of one man, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. Now, those are things that are understood and grasped from special revelation from the scriptures. Uh, Paul doesn't open the, the scriptures, perhaps, to demonstrate it, but he simply refers to it and speaks it. Uh, there's a place for us uh, to make use of what the scriptures say, even perhaps before we've had the, con the conversation about defending uh, our doctrine of scripture and the inerrancy of the word of God. And here's, and here's the reason why, okay? Uh, the God who is made known in the scriptures is the same God who is made known in the works of his creation. So we, let me say that again, the, sa the same God who's made, the God made known in the scriptures is the same God made known in the works that he has made. Um, so think about it this, we feel like we're making a huge jump and perhaps an unbeliever may accuse you of making a huge jump and that you're going from things that they accept generally in the world and suddenly you're jumping to what the scriptures say. But I want you to think about this. Does God think you're changing the subject? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, we are simply speaking of him and continue to speak of him as he has made himself known. Uh, remember that. Um, that it is not necessary. We, we want to be careful not too much to say you can't refer to, you can't say anything that is in the scriptures until you have first demonstrated um, the inerrancy and the authority of the scriptures. This is an important thing to, to get to, but I just encourage you uh, to, uh, to hold on to that loosely uh, and to remember we're not changing the subject when we speak of the content of what the scriptures say. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says this, and even uh, making this known in, in, in very creational kind of terms. We'll begin in verse 5. Um, actually, no, verse 6. Second uh, Corinthians 4, 6. Paul talking about his own ministry as, of, uh, as a, a, a minister of the gospel. Uh, For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Notice how Paul identifies these things. The God who has spoken all things into being, whose glory is made known in creation, is the same God whose glory is made known in the face of Jesus Christ. You're not changing the subject. Keep that in mind in terms of how it is that we approach uh, things um, in a conversation with unbelievers. Second thing, and here's why uh, uh, even an understanding of the scriptures is so crucial. The scriptures 
Let's see what I have here. Um, the, gospel, the gospel alone is able to change the heart of sinful man. Uh, if you want, if our concern, and I hope this is, <laughs> we want people to be persuaded of the truth, to be convicted by the truth, to lay hold of and to believe the truth and to turn to the Lord, guess what? That requires a heart change. Um, general revelation has never changed anyone's heart. In fact, Romans 1, it is the clarity of revelation in the things that God has made that actually makes the suppressing of the truth so vigorous. It gets through, therefore it needs, there's a lot of work involved in terms of suppressing the things that get, that get through. So remember this, we need, we need in some fashion the scriptures. Um, this is what the Lord uses to actually change the heart of sinful man. Uh, this is what we are aiming at and certainly would desire uh, the Lord to do in his kindness, uh, to change those uh, whom, we would, um, uh, whom we would speak with. Uh, and here's the third thing, though, that I want you to notice um, in, in thinking about the, the condition of sinful man and what it is that, uh, that the true revelation of God as God has made known in his existence and attributes is very clear in the works that he has made, it gets through, and we are unable to even accept and to receive those things apart from the working of God's Holy Spirit uh, in the preaching of the gospel as made known in the scriptures, at least the content of the scriptures. We recognize that, but, the, but here's what I want you to notice. That special revelation, how do I put it here? Special revelation, what for us is the, is the scriptures, special revelation is, is the necessary companion of general revelation from before the fall. Let me say that again. I'll, I'll show you where this comes from. Special revelation is the necessary companion of general revelation from before the fall, which means the special and unique revelation of God in his word is not only necessary because of sin, in fact, it was necessary and given even before the fall. It is at least necessary because of sin. Uh, but its, it's, it's, its need actually comes before the fall. Now, let me show you where that comes from. Turn to Genesis 2, if you would. Uh, Genesis 2, verse 16. Well, no, we'll back up to verse 9. Genesis 2, verse 9. Out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of the life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now jump down to verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Um, here is at least one instance, at least one instance, uh, where uh, general revelation is not sufficient in itself, even before the fall. God gave a special and unique word by which he was to interpret what he saw. There was at least one tree that was not the same as all of the others, whatever it is your eyes may see. Um, it, it may be just as beautiful, appear to give fruit, a fruit that is just as useful and helpful to nourish and strengthen you, just as much made by God as any other tree. Um, but you need to know something that is different about this, and that the tree is defined and understood covenantally in terms of what it is only by this word that is heard and understood. If you eat of this tree, you're breaking my word, and on the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Uh, there is a disclosing of, of particular covenant that is made known here that is not generally discerned, but actually is the complement of those things that are seen in the works of his hands. Does that make sense? Um, so I'll just say this. In terms of the place that the scriptures have, remember, remember, 
if they were necessary even for, if the, if the special, unique revelation of God was necessary even for Adam and Eve before the fall, how much more do you think it's still necessary even now to understand basically the things that we see, the things that we experience? There's something similar in Genesis 3, even after the fall, where you can at least see this, that part of what the scriptures say, what the scriptures illumine, and part of where we want to go to oftentimes, where we'll go in this class, is to show how the scriptures actually make known certain things that you may not discern in itself apart from the revelation of God. What these things are, things like sin. How often, how, how often are we wondering, where does sin come from and what, it, what is it? Why is there evil? The reality of judgment, that was made known in Genesis 2. The day you eat of it, you will surely die. Even before the fall, here was a special revelation with regard to the judgment of God. Uh, common grace is made known in Genesis 3. The fact that the Lord, though, though, though his wrath is deserved, there is a withholding of his wrath. The fact that there is suffering of any kind of kind. The way of salvation, even. Uh, things made known that are true of the world as it is. Uh, but not to be understood or grasped in the things that God has made alone. Uh, There has always been an interplay between special revelation and general revelation. Now, there's one comment uh, before moving on. Um, uh, This, this again, what I'm suggesting here, um, is is, is a little bit tricky in practice. (laughs) Uh, uh, I would encourage you just to remember that in the experience of conversation with other people and even perhaps in in our own experience in how it is that we understand the world and how we come to faith, uh, there is an overlapping and interplay of of discerning the realities that are around us and an understanding of the Word of God. Um, And insofar as we finally grasp what is true in the world, And who God is and what he has done, the fact that he is the creator of all things, that he is patient as he is. We may grasp that when we look out in the world. Um, And there are times when it's hard to distinguish. Has has that been the source of understanding? It's changed my heart. Or is it the fruit of having been changed? Um, What I'm saying is that the scriptures hold out is that it is in fact the uh, the fruit of having a changed heart. Though perhaps in our experience Uh, It is at times what we are first conscious and aware of. Uh, But the point is uh, that special revelation has always been tied to general revelation. From before the fall, shortly after the fall, and that is what the Lord uses to change hearts. uh, And the God made known in the scriptures is the same God made known in the things that he has made. Uh, From his perspective, we are not changing the subject but making known what he himself has first made known in his word. A uh, few comments then on persuasion, and then we'll pause for thoughts and questions before getting into our first topic in this class. Um, we've touched on this uh, a little bit, but just, just remember, um, we desire uh, to be as persuasive and winsome as we can to m- make use of the full uh, uh, the fullness of whatever resources we have in terms of our understanding, the use of logic and reasoning, the compelling uh, nature that comes in terms of how it is that we live, an understanding of beauty and morality, the full scope of whatever it is an unbeliever has experienced in this life, in this world, all of these sorts of things. But we have to remember that ultimately persuasion comes, the persuasion of belief and understanding comes by the power of the Holy Spirit. We use all of these things in dependence upon him. We begin and end with prayer and pray even perhaps while we are speaking. (laughs) If someone someone is struck by an argument that you have made, don't feel so proud about yourself. (laughs) If someone does not grasp what you are saying, it may be that you're just speaking gibberish. But it may also be that the Holy Spirit has not been kind to open eyes and hearts, at least yet. Uh, persuasion comes ultimately uh, by the Holy Spirit. Uh, second thing, um, again, we've mentioned this, but make use of the full breadth of what we can persuade by. Um, uh, we're going to spend a lot of this class uh, uh, thinking and talking about the kinds of things that we can say 
to others. And that's true. We need to do that. That's part of what 1 Peter 3.15 has an emphasis on. What we speak, how we respond with our, with our mouth, perhaps even at times in writing, uh, but some communication of truth. But we want to remember the full breadth of persuasion in terms of logic, practice, how it is that we live, how often is, is a testimony undermined by how it is that we live or perhaps confirmed and people won over by seeing the fruit of the Lord's work in our lives, the, 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 the beauty and the, and the practicality of wisdom, uh, the, uh, the understanding of what true holiness and goodness and joy and thanksgiving is. These are, these, are, these are part of the full scope of what the Lord can use in terms of persuading and seeing what the truth is and the fruit that comes from the truth. Uh, so when you speak uh, to others, make use of all of these things, and remember as well that there is a call for us to love the person we are speaking to. You're not just trying to win an argument. <laughs> I said this in our first class. I have had times when I have won arguments, but I failed really to love the person that I spoke to. And what I got out of it is everyone else around me was really impressed with what I said, except for the person that I was speaking to. It just felt pounded. Look, it's not worth it. You're not trying to win an argument. Um, th- I mean, remember the image that we've used. It's like, it's like we're, we're interacting with people. Unbel- to be in the state of unbelief in this world is like walking around a room with all sorts of obstacles on it and you're blind. If you don't love the person, it's like, it's like looking at the person who's blind and sticking your foot out in front of them and laughing that they fall on their face. It's, Look how foolish you are. See, you don't, can't make sense of anything. Come on, we don't want to do that. There's, there's a concern to love and to care for those around us. Uh, that means our own hearts need to be changed. We've got to pray for that. Uh, there are times when we restrain ourselves in what we speak because we're not simply looking for an opportunity to shoot someone with a bullet, a silver bullet. Don't use a silver bullet, even if you have one. You're not simply just trying to get through, right? You don't want to kill them. Why would you use a silver bullet? But you don't want to persuade. You do want it to get through, but out of love and be compelling. Uh, when we speak uh, to others, uh, there is a concern that we speak what is compelling to us. This is crucial. Uh, when we are studying these things and considering the revelation of God and the things that he has made, even his own revelation in the scriptures, um, it first comes to you. <laughs> in fact, even uh, in Romans 1, it's interesting where Paul goes as he's speaking about unbelief in general and sin in general in the world. Do you know where he goes in Romans 2? Does anyone remember this? Right at the end of Romans 1, uh, where he says, uh, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Next verse. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. Uh, we do the same things. Why do we not respond in faith? As long as we do not, in the patience of God, what are we doing? We're simply storing up wrath for ourselves, Paul says. That's where he goes. As much as we recognize these things in the world around us, uh, you will ignore your own heart to your own peril. Don't do it. But insofar as we are convinced and we are persuaded, uh, there is a compelling opportunity to speak the truth. Um, If there is anything in this class that you think may, may be persuasive to somebody else because it sounds impressive to other people, but you haven't quite grasped it and it's not yet compelling to you, don't start just repeating what you hear. (laughs) Spend time thinking through it, meditating upon these things. Uh, Be persuaded yourself first before you start speaking to others. Um, We have to do that. Why? Well, the call is uh, not simply to throw around whatever hammers we receive, but as 1 Peter 3.15, to give an answer to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is within you. If it's not your hope, you're not obeying uh, 1 Peter 3.15. You understand these things uh, before it is that we open our mouths to speak. Um, in terms of uh, knitting together some of the things that we said about general revelation and, and how it is that we're exposing even the way that there is a functional dependence on the things that is true that are true, in terms of uh, practically what sort of things do we say to persuade, as much as, that we can, as much as we can stick to the same kind of line of thinking and draw a line through all four of these aspects and features that we've discussed, perhaps the more persuasive. You can deal with things that an unbeliever says explicitly, You can deal with things that are central to their understanding, but perhaps are only implicit and unacknowledged. 
Um, uh, but I think what you'll find uh, as we go through this class and as we have conversations with others, um, that the apologetic task is simply to hold out an invitation, uh, to have it, even to be invited ourselves into faithfully responding to an unbelieving world uh, so that you might know your God more fully and richly. That, again, is the context in First Peter. He's assuming we're suffering for righteousness' sake, perhaps slandered, but desiring to respond faithfully. Not simply responding faithfully because we know it's going to work, <laughs> but we respond faithful, faithfully because we're entrusting ourselves to a faithful creator. Your call is to be faithful unto our God, to give an answer for the reason and for the hope that is within you. Um, the Lord is the one uh, that will bring forth the fruit of change in the lives of others.